Welcome back to part two of David Ellison's Bass Rig. Before we pick up where we left off last time, I'd like to bring your attention to a bass that was left out of last episode. Around 1996, during the recording of Cryptic Writings, Dave mentions he was using a Spectre NS2 and a Quantum 5 string to record with. I was under the impression it was one of the basses used during Euthanasia. However, new information has come to light. The five string used on Cryptic Writings has been described as the crown jewel of modulus basses. A 1994 one of a kind modulus with a white phenoic fingerboard. One of the rarest modulus basses around. As well as one of Dave's main basses used from 1996 up until 1999. Thanks again to Ron from New Jersey for sharing that information with me and making the picture a little bit clearer. Okay, amplifiers. <laughs> When Dave first got his bass guitar, the Gibson EB0, the accompanying amplifier was a Fender Bassman with a 12 inch speaker. As we've discussed, Dave moved to LA when he was 18. He made the trip with a couple of friends from Minnesota, and after several weeks they decided to return home, leaving Dave in LA to chase the LA dream. After several weeks, the friends decided they've had enough and decided to return home, leaving Dave to follow his dreams alone. Dave mentions in an interview with Premier Guitar, that he took a Roland Cube amp with him, stating, that's how we composed the first two Megadeth records. In addition to the Cube amp, Dave also brought with him a PA system. As he learned early on, he would struggle to be heard against guitar amps. Um, I brought that in. In fact, my bass amp I brought to California with me was my PA system from my band in, uh, in Minnesota. So I had like a PA, you know? <laughs> this is a letter that was printed in More Life With Death from Dave to one of his friends who gave up on the LA Dream. He describes a recent Megadeth show around the time Kerry King was in the band. It shows a rough drawing of the stage plan. I have six bass cabs plus Matt's, I think that says Matt, I have no idea. I have six bass cabs plus Matt's two Marshall cabs, Matt's head and a 200 watt Marshall head. Dave had nine heads and six cabs. So did Kerry King. Believe me, it was powerful. It's been said that Megadeth and their supporting acts would combine their amplifiers together into one massive super rig. For the recording of both Peace Cells and Killing Is My Business, Dave mentioned he uses an Ashley preamp into an AB power amp, but doesn't mention the models used. This is also present in the Peace Cells liner notes. The notes also mention Ellison using the Cure bass cabinets with Sirwin Vegas speakers. Not much is known about these cabinets as the company is no longer in business. By May 1986, Megadeth had already released Killing It Is My Business and toured a whole bunch. When Dave first came across the Jackson bass, he plugged it into a Galleon Kruger 800 RB head with a Hartkey 4x10 and a 115XL cab. Plugging my Jackson bass into a head that was plugged into the Hartkey cabinets and bang, tone was born. And that became uh, really a signature part of, of not only my sound, but certainly the uh, the pointed, edgy uh, tone of thrash metal for thrash metal bass playing. You know? As Dave said, this tone would become the definition of his sound, and it stayed with him through So Far So Good So What, Rust in Peace, right up until Countdown to Extinction. During this period, you may come across some variation in the cabinet configuration. Usually you'll find four or six 8x10 cabinets on either side of the stage, or sometimes all stage right. Also included on the Countdown Tour, Dave mentions that Hartkey shipped in some custom 2x15s, and can spot a pair of early Hartkey 3500s. Following this, the biggest change came about with Euthanasia, where Dave switches to Ampeg SVT2 Pros, and matching 8x10 cabinets. This was brought on tour and seen in the following clip, and mentioned in our friend Ron's letter. For Cryptic Writings, we see another update with the introduction of the PV Kilo head, which ran into a pair of Mackie 1400 eyes. Dave also describes his recording setup for the album. I ran the instrument through a PV T-Max head into a 1x15 cabinet. I also ran full range into a PV Kilo bass head and TVX 8x10 cabinet. Finally, I split the signal into Marty's Crate 100 watt head and 4x12 cabinet which added that nice gritty distortion you can hear across the album's bass tone. This is a picture of Dave's rack at the time. At the top, just out of picture, is a Furman power supply, a Mesa Boogie amplifier rack switcher, 
used to switch between cabs should one of them go down. A Samsung wireless receiver, and this unit here. Well, I'll be honest, I have a few ideas on what I think it is. But I'll spare myself the embarrassment. If you know what this is, please let me know in the comments because it's driving me mad. It looks like some sort of DSP unit, a noise gate, or a power amp. So if you know what this is, tell me in the comments. A whirlwind multi-selector to switch between the bases. A Sanzant PSA-1, another Thurman, a PV Kilo, and Mackie M1400i power amps twice. Dave addresses these changes directly, posting this photo on his Instagram. It was taken around 1999 on the Risk Tour. He goes on to say the PV heads utilize digital technology in the power section, and if you drive them too loud, they shut down into safe mode to prevent damage. Not ideal. As bass players, we usually want a little bit of drive in our amplifiers. From the power out, the signal goes into four PV TVX 8x10s. Dave describes the Mackies as musical and incredibly loud. The Sans amp was sent directly to front of house via a DI. More in effects later. Dave confirmed the use of this rig in 2001, and it can also be seen on the Rude Awakening live DVD, with the PV 8x10s underneath the Marshall cabinets. He then continued to use PV well into the Megadeth break. During F5 performances, you can see the PV 8x10, which were powered by the PV Max 700 heads. Towards the end of the break in 2009, Dave performs with Hale, and on stage is an Ashdown Mag 4x10 combo, with a second 4x10 cabinet underneath. 2010, back to Megadeth. Dave knew he was going to take part in the Rust in Peace anniversary tour. His plan was to capture the original Rust in Peace tone through the use of Jackson basses and Hart Key High Drive amplifiers. As we came back this year and, and began the uh, Rust in Peace 20th anniversary tour, I wanted to give the exact look, sound, the whole thing of, of what the original was. And, and the Hart Key stuff is new and improved, which is great. Um, so it has the, you know, a modern tone to it, but it definitely duplicated that sound exactly as it needed to be. Originally, he used the Hartkey LH1000, plugged into a brand new high drive 8x10 cabinet. If you take a look at the Samsung website, parent company of Hartkey, they state Dave was using 8x10s as early as 2010. However, depending on when you see him, he could be using a 4x10s. The original Hartkey cabs back in the 80s had aluminium speaker cones, while the new high drives boast both paper and aluminium cones. Stop looking at me like that, you know it's aluminium. Dave also specifies that one stack has the tweeter turned on and the other switched off, as not to overdo it with the high end. He also describes his thought process building his tone. The Megadeth guitar tone is built on the sound of Marshall amps, which is very thick in the mid range. To work with that, I developed a sound using active pickups and very modern high tech amplification which put a really big wallop on the bottom end. I also added a very clicky, noticeable presence to my treble frequencies, so I almost scooped the mid-range completely. For me, the combination of Jackson basses and heart key amplifiers really delivers what I need. I have my own bit of real estate in the sonic spectrum of Megadeth. Around mid-2013, Dave upgrades the LH1000 to a brand new heart key kilo. No specific reason has been given, but compared to the LH1000, the Hartkey Kilo has all the bells and whistles. Hartkey then released the High Drives HD around 2017. These cabs are an improvement to the High Drives of the past, boasting an optimized ferrite magnet assembly and steel chassis design to deliver a maximum power to weight ratio. They're also a lot lighter in comparison. Dave goes on to use the HDs and the Kilo right into present day. The only footnote to this section is during both past and recent Megadeth recordings. During the recording of Dystopia in 2015, this picture was released on Dave's Instagram. It shows the Hartkey high drives, PV VB 8x10, and Ampeg 8x10. Also seen on the far left is a Dave Mustaine Marshall 4x12 signature cap. Premier Guitar also report that Dave used an Ampeg CL during this period. Recent pictures have been released of Megadeth in the studio summer 2019. Here you'll find Dave with two Hartkey 4x10XLs, PV VB 8x10, two High Drive 4x10s, another 2x10XL on top, and again a Dave Mustaine signature Marshall. In his rack you can see a pair of Hartkey LH1000s and an Ampeg SVT3 Pro. Effects 
probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of David Ellison. However, you'd be surprised to hear that he's used quite a lot over the years. One of the earliest instances I've come across was mentioned in Ron's letter in 1995. The Roland One octave keyboard pedal triggers a Proteus sound emulator for parts in several of the songs. Dave explains this is so he could emulate the special effects from the record. I haven't been able to find a Roland octave one. Typically a Roland octave pedal refers to this. As the Proteus has a MIDI input, I believe it could have been controlled using a Roland PK6. Speaking in an interview with Mitch Lafon, Dave admits, the only part of the live show I use any effect at all is Dawn Patrol and Poison is the Cure. I only use a chorus pedal for those exact moments. I really don't use an effect for anything else. But I had been toying with distortion for that riff in Face of Illusion. As a result of these riffs, a number of chorus type pedals have made their way through Dave's rig. For the Rust in Peace reunion tour in 2010, Dave was sporting a Digitech CR7 chorus pedal or sometimes an MXR flanger, depending on his preference at the time. I have one Digitech pedal, and I go back and forth between a Digitech and there's an MXR uh, flanger, but right now I'm using this Digitech stereo chorus. I go back and forth between the Digitech and the MXR, yeah, yeah, yeah. depending on which one serves the tone purpose of, Everybody of is the day. 31. At the same time this interview is published back in 2010, the Jim Dunlop website posted that Dave was using an MXR stereo chorus and an MXR bass DI. This is the only reference I've come across for either of these pedals. Dunlop have also listed Dave using the wrong plectrum size. A 50mm pitch black. But considering Dave said in Dunlop's video listed just below this, he uses green 88s. Jim Dunlop, uh, I think that's a 0.88 uh, Tortex pick, right? The yep, ones. the green ones, yep. I would take this with a pinch of salt and not an opportunity to sell more units. Premier Guitar also reports Dave using a Providence Anodyne bass chorus around 2016. Other chorus pedals in recent years is the Dawn Patrol pedal, released by Protones in 2017. This particular pedal was used to retain the bottom end when engaged, as most pedals tend to suck the tone right out of it. As Dave mentioned, he's also been playing with some overdrive. One of the earliest instances of this was the PSA-1 back in 1999. It has since been upgraded to the Sans Amp RBI, and seen in recent recording pictures. Something a bit more permanent is the dual bass station made by Providence. Dave explains, it adds that really crisp tone, that high end component I have on Countdown to Extinction record. That's just kind of a general tone enhancer. I don't really think of it as a pedal. It's kind of on all the time during live shows. You can see it sitting off stage in this clip alongside the stereo chorus. In 2017, Dave posted he was using the KHDK Abyss Space Overdrive with Metal Allegiance. After several more months, KHDK created his very own Fallout Abyss Space Overdrive. Apart from pedals in Megadeth, Dave has used pedals in his side projects. The Hartkey Bass Attack has also seen use in the studio and bass clinics. As Dave admits, he doesn't use it live with Megadeth. The only news regarding pedals comes from 2018, with the first hint at a David Ellison Beta DSP. From their website, the Beta Bass DSP is a floor control bass guitar system with a fully programmable super precision digital bass preamp with studio quality effects. It looks cool, it's definitely expensive, and I can't wait to see what Dave makes with it. And now finally we're into the home stretch. Strings, pickups, and miscellaneous stuff. Dave's been for a bunch of string providers in the past. Initially, back in the 80s, he was using a Roto Sound swing bass set before eventually trying out Dean Markley strings. By the end of the 90s, Dave and the band would be using Diodario. I've never heard of this set, and Diodario hasn't bothered to provide me with any answers. Harky, on the other hand, thank you for replying. For the return of Megadeth in 2010, Dave uses sit or stay in tune strings. He also mentions they've created him his own signature pack, 45 to 128, which are available online. Pickups are nice and straightforward. For the most part, Dave's bases were stock. You can see some changes in the pickups in the BC Riches and were famously known as EMGs. In the first wave of Jacksons used from 1987 to 1994, all had proprietary active electronics and Jackson pickups. In the bases that followed, the Moduli, the Fender Deluxes, the Jazz, the Zodiac 5-string, the BC Rich, and post-2010 Jackson models 
all had active electronics and were fitted with EMGs and you'll still find these fitted today. Introduced in January 2019, EMG has released a David Ellison signature set, a dual coil pickup in the bridge and a ceramic and steel in the neck. Taking a look at the vintage fenders, they look to remain stock. And as we've discussed in part one already, they were powered with an Aguilar preamp to boost their line signal. The only other exception here is the four string Zodiac, which was fitted with baseline pickups essentially Seymour Duncan's. This rack was used in 2010, and I've heard no news of it changing. The typical rack setup includes a Furman power supply, Whirlwind multi-selector, Shure UR4D, Peterson strobe rack tuner, and amps on the bottom. The LH1000s are shown here, but I believe that later on, they're changed to the Hartke kilos. Nice and simple. The only other accessory Dave uses are high mass bridges. Many of his original basses use the Badass 2 bridge. But from 2010 onwards, the Jackson basses came with their very own proprietary high mass bridge. In the next Know Your Bass Player, I'm going to be taking a look at Peter Steele from Typo Negative, or possibly Rex Brown from Pantera. Let me know what you think about those two suggestions. Remember to click the subscribe button and the bell icon so you will be notified when that episode is out. And if there's a bass player you want to see on the channel, let me know in the comments because I might just do it. Take a look at the show notes for a list of everything mentioned in today's video. There's so much history of Dave and not enough time. You can take a look at the details that haven't made it into this video and the show notes for every other episode. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.